Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, we have prayed, and I thank you, Father, for the word tonight. I ask, Almighty God, that you cause my mind to be focused, that I would say what you want said, and that I would skip over the things that are not necessary for the sake of your people. I pray, Father, for each and every family here and each and every grandparent and parent here that, Lord God Almighty, you would anoint them with a special anointing from heaven to reach this generation and to be what we've never been, Lord, and to do what we've never done, that we might see the kingdom come and the return of the king, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Psalm 127, and I'm going to begin there. And we'll launch from there into parenting. Uh, Jim was wonderful last two, two weeks ago, and I'm following him. I've got a lot of material because we have raised four children. We brought a blended family together. We have 12 grandchildren. Our oldest grandson is Parker, and he's going to be 22 this year, and he's married and in the Navy. He's not, he's not pregnant yet. Jazzy's not pregnant yet, but... Eventually they will be, and we will be great grandparents. But we are grandparents right now of 12, and we have 10 boys and two little girls, Chloe and Emma. And we have an incredible family, but it was not always an incredible family. It was broken and splintered and busted up. And Jim and I are, have been in our old life before Jesus, scoundrels. You've heard our testimony. Jim was married multiple times before he married me. And I was only married once, but I lived with everybody else. And so we found Jesus Christ, and then he brought us together into this union of 35 years. And we have seen God absolutely work miracles as we have cooperated with the Holy Spirit and raised a family, a family of heroes and a family of ministers. And I'm here to tell you tonight that there is no family that is out of the reach of God's miracle working power. I don't care where you're at with your kids. I don't care if right now they're renegades and they're running from God and working on their testimonies. I don't care if you brought a blended family together and you're the evil stepmother or the evil stepfather. Wherever your family is, or perhaps your family is healthy and intact and you're just living the dream, good on you and you need... You need to keep living that dream. But wherever your family is, if it's not where it needs to be, I'm here to tell you that God's will is for it to be on track, set right. He wants to make the crooked places straight. And it's his plan and it's his will that your family be functioning in the kingdom of heaven, be magnificent on the earth, and fulfill their destinies. That's the plan of God. And in Psalm chapter 127, it says, beginning with verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Now I want you to go with me to Genesis, and we're going to look in, in Genesis, and we're going to look at the beginnings and the origins, and, and keep your finger there in Psalm chapter 127, and I want you to see something. In Genesis chapter 1, looking at verse 27 and 28 it says so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them then God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air over every living thing that moves on the earth now going back to Psalm 127 we see that God blessed Adam and Eve, said, be fruitful, multiply. Fill this earth with your image. Fill this earth with descendants. And those descendants will have dominion. 
So there are two things that God has stated very clearly out of the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. God has established that we would be fruitful and multiply, that we would have descendants, children. Children are reward. Children are not something that we are to abort. Children are not something that we are to hate. Children are not something that we are to avoid. Children are a gift from God. They are something that is a reward from heaven. Descendants. And God says, these descendants, Adam and Eve, you're not going to be able to do this just by the two of you. The two of you aren't going to be able to subdue and have dominion over this earth. You're going to need to multiply. And in your multiplication, your descendants are going to have dominion. They are going to rule this planet as under rulers, as I rule the heavens, you are going to rule this earth. That was the plan of God from the beginning. And God hasn't retracted his plan. He has not brought forth and then he has not decided to change his mind and retract his blessing on humanity. God has fulfilled his word. Every word of God is full of power and promise. As the heavens and as the snow comes down and the rain comes down, it says in Isaiah 55, and covers the earth and brings bread to the eater, so it, it brings seed and bread, and it does not return void, even so every word of God will bring forth what it is accomplished and what it's purpose to do, and it will not return void. God blessed humanity, said be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion. Then something happened. The fall came, Adam and Eve handed this title deed of earth over to Satan through their transgression, rebellion. Satan took this planet and now is the underlord over this planet and we are in a fallen system. Can you say amen to that? Now because we're in a fallen system, go with me to Genesis chapter 3. God says, because of this, and he knew this was going to happen, this is no surprise to him, the plan of redemption was brought forth before the foundations of the earth. His original intent, Genesis, the original intent, the prototype, was to have descendants and have dominion. Can you see that? Yes, say yes. Because of the fall, consequence came in. In chapter 3, in Genesis chapter 3, God says to the serpent, because you've done this, there's going to be a war between you and the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That's the first messianic promise in the Old Testament. He goes on and he speaks to Eve. And he says to her in chapter 3, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, your conception, and pain. You'll bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Eve, because of the consequence of what you've done, now you're going to have children. And now there's going to be pain and labor. Not only is there going to be pain and labor in bringing them forth, but pain and labor in raising them because now they're going to have a sin nature. They're not going to be what they were supposed to be yet. They're going to be born into sin. Just like Pastor preached this morning. They're going to have a fallen nature and the kingdom that you are now under Instead of you having dominion, now the enemy is going to have dominion. And there's a war going on between his seed and the seed of the woman, Messiah's seed. There's going to be and there is now a raging war. Are you with me? That's why my husband said today, if you abandon your children and let them decide what they're going to do, you cause them to become victims of the enemy's strategy and tactics because there is a war at hand it is blazing and if we don't wake up and realize who we're fighting and what we're fighting for we will put down our weapons and give up and say this is just too hard but God told Eve this was going to be a lot of hard work and then he speaks to Adam and he says to Adam because you have heeded the wife of your wife, the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree for which I've commanded you, saying you shall not eat it. Looking at verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3, cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. For you return to the ground, until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. 
Now, God did not curse Adam and Eve. He blessed them. But God cursed two things. He cursed the serpent and he cursed the earth. The earth is under a curse. Therefore, what was not supposed to be hard, what was not supposed to be difficult, now is very hard and there is toil and the sweat of your brow. And what should be easy isn't easy. Can I get a witness out of that? And if you wonder why things are so hard for you and some things look so easy for other people, could it be a part of this war that you're engaged in? And if we don't know how to fight in this war and how to stand up against the darkness for the sake of our children and our children's children, then we are giving them over as victims because God spoke to the serpent and he said, you're going to lick up the dust all of your days. And he just called Adam dust. So Satan's job as a dragon is to lick up the dust and to devour our sons and our daughters as much as he can. And it says in Romans the eighth chapter that the serpent sees us as sheep for the slaughter. Now I don't know about you, but it really makes me mad. When I began to find out who my king was, that he was the year of Jubilee, he was the tree of life. He was the kinsman redeemer. He was the lamb of God. He was the only begotten of the father. He was bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. He became a man for me, went to Calvary's cross, laid his life down, took on the sin of death and hell, took the keys of death and hell, raised from the dead, took his blood to the mercy seat as seated at the right hand of the father. And I am his people. We are the church he's the head and he is a supreme power over all creation in the universe it just kind of makes me a little mad when satan says we're sheep for the slaughter and our children are nothing but dust for him to lick up and it should make you mad and if it doesn't make you mad i pray that there'll be such a fury and a fire that will begin to grow on the inside of you that there will be a holy revelation that will begin to rumble on the inside of your spirit. That you'll begin to stand up and say, no, oh hell, no, you'll not have my family. You'll not have my marriage. You'll not have my children. You'll not devour my grandchildren. You'll not take this city. You'll not take my neighborhood. You will not prevail in the name of Jesus. But until we begin to get off our butts and put on our war gear and begin to fight again and realize why we're on this planet and what we're on this planet for, then we're going to sit in these green chairs. We're going to walk out those doors. We're going to get in our cars. And we'll just go back and face life. And we're not changing. When the very power of God is on the inside of you, and Jesus said, where two or more agree is touching anything on this earth, it'll be done for him. And if you've got a marriage partner sitting with you right now, there isn't anything you two can't agree on. And if it's the will of God, if it's in the word and the promise of God, God says you can have it. But there's all kinds of hell breaking loose to divide marriages, to discourage couples, to put down their weapons, to stop fighting and stop believing God. Because parenting is it a war all by itself so welcome to the war of being christian parents but paul says it's a fight of faith and it's a good fight because we win and just like there was a generation that had to die in the wilderness because they refused to believe god they refused to do what God said to do. When they saw the giants in the promised land, they said, we are grasshoppers and we cannot go in there and take it. And God said, you're gonna die out, but your children are gonna raise up and they're gonna be my heroes and they're gonna take the land. And you know, I believe this generation, my grandchildren, I believe this is a generation of heroes. I believe there is, there are heroic, sons and daughters that have not yet come forth 
but they're just brewing right now. And you and I are nursemaids, nanas, babas, and moms and dads over God's nursery of heroes for this generation. They could be the generation that brings back the return of the king. And I need to take this very seriously. So, having said that, I want to talk to you about raising up God's heroes. I'm going to give you six things. If I get it done tonight, praise God. If not, would you let me do part two? Because as pastors, we brought a blended family together. Jim had a daughter, Kimberly. And Kim, can you just stand up and just face everybody and just wave at them? This is Kimberly. <laughs> Jessica, could you stand up? Pastor Luke is in here. And I have another daughter, Miranda. She and her husband, Kenny Bosman, pastor of the Rock of Temecula. And they have four children there. So she's not here tonight. But we, I had a daughter, Miranda. Jim had a daughter, Kim. And then together, we had Jessica and we had Luke. So we had his, mine, and ours. So we brought a blended family. Are there any blended families in the house tonight? Okay. Are there any families in here that you've not, you're not a blended family? Just the two of you from the start. Let me see your hands. Oh, blessings to you. Blessings. Awesome. Awesome. Well done. And you're going to stay together until God comes or until death parts you, and then you'll be together in eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's the plan of God. So God's plan is to bless us with children. His plan is for us to have dominion. His plan is, to, like Jim preached this morning, his plan is to redeem us. His plan is to reconcile us back to the Father. His plan is to give us the kingdom, and then his plan is to restore us. That means he gives us back what we've lost, which is the kingdom of heaven and dominion. But it's dominion under the authority of the king himself, Jesus. So let's look and see, how do we raise these kids up? Well, I had to learn some things. When I married Jim, I had this little girl. She was only nine years old. Kim was only five. We, we had just little kids. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to be parents. We came from, from you know, intact families. My dad and my mom were still married. They're still married today. Jim's mom and dad were married. There was, a, I was born in 1950, he was born in 1945. We are the old boomers, and we came out of that hero generation. The kids, my mom and dad and Jim's mom and dad were the depression kids and they fought in World War II. And so we were raised up in this generation that was just loved by our parents. They came out of the war and they were glad to be alive and they just had a baby boom and America prospered as Europe and as all of East Asia was completely bombed, we manufactured, we made things, we got rich. And we got raised up. And in 1964, I remember the Beatles. I was 14 years old and Ed Sullivan. And all of a sudden, everything started to change. And rock and roll came in. And she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Changed music. All of a sudden came free love. All of a sudden came abortion. All of a sudden, prayer was thrown out of schools. All of a sudden, a revolution happened. And everything changed in just one generation from what it was to what we insisted on as a very loved and coddled generation from the, World War II bait, from the World War II hero generation. We decided this is what we must have. We must have free love. We must have women's rights. We must have prayer out of the school. We must be free. And all of a sudden, everything started to change in our world. And landmarks were moved. And all of a sudden, massive things were shifting in the spirit realm. And now, as we are grandparents and our children have been raised up, this is a legacy that we have left parenting. And that is a nation that is split and divided, that morality has absolutely left. And you know the nation that we're living in right now, that drugs now, marijuana is legal in many, many states and it will be legal here. Everything is changing again. And darkness is growing, and darkness seems to be rising. Do you, do you feel that as you look around? Well, I've lived long enough to watch it change. And so that is what I can say as a grandmother now in my 60s, and watching and looking back with hindsight, I can say that this is a very strategic time in the spirit realm and in the church because we better pay attention to what God is saying to us. So now here we are. We're raising up children and grandchildren in a generation 
that has lost its morality, lost its truth, in a generation that is unchurched and thinks Christianity is foolish. It's just one of many world religions now. So what do we do as, as the church? So here we are, Jim and I got married. We got married in 1979. We got pregnant, gosh, the first, first couple of months, we had a snowstorm in Lake Arrowhead and there was no heat and boom, we got pregnant and here comes Jess. Did we want Jess? No, not particularly. We were just going to be single. We each had our, our children. That was it. But when Jessica came, we just fell hopelessly and absolutely in love with her. Then, boom, here comes Luke. Did we want Luke? We weren't planning Luke either. We finally learned if you, the law of sowing and reaping. If you sow sperm, you're going to get babies. <laughs> it took us a while, but we learned that. So now we have four children, three girls and two boys. And we never thought of ourselves as great parents. We never thought of ourselves as people that were homeschoolers and the people that were just these wonderful set of parents. And Jim and I were just kind of rough and tough and tumble. And we were, somehow we got into the ministry and we were learning how to pastor. We weren't very good at that either. And we were not quite sure what we were doing. And so we began to raise our children. We loved our family. We loved our children. We have always loved our children. And I loved being a pregnant. I loved being a mom. There wasn't anything I wanted to do more than just be a mom. I wanted to be a mom. But I wasn't exactly very smart about what God had to say about raising up kids. So I had to learn, just like I had to learn how to be a godly wife, I had to learn how to be a godly mother. So I had to go to the Word. And so there were some things that we had to learn. And we had to learn, now, now we have a blended family. Kimberly doesn't live with us. And Kim, with your permission, I'm just going to be honest about our blended family because that's going to be one of my points. Kimberly didn't live with us. She was raised by her mom and they had moved to Las Vegas and they didn't think much of us. And I was kind of at this point the evil stepmother when Kim came to, to stay with us. She wasn't exactly crazy about me. And I, I think it'd be great to have a panel maybe if I go to two sessions and, and have questions and answers and, and bring our kids up because they can tell you about blended families and, and maybe some things to do and not to do. We've done this at Girlfriends in Our Women's Ministry. I don't know if that would be helpful or not, but... Here we are, and so Kim's coming to stay with us on weekends and maybe every other weekend or once a month, and, and things aren't going so well, but she comes and life goes on, and the kids are in, in school, and they grow up, and we're, we're pastoring, and they live in the church, and, you know, we did some stupid things. Gosh, I think I left Luke a couple of times, forgot to get him in church, and we went home, and he was still there. Do you think that's kind of twisted him a little bit, honey? That, that's why he's a little quirky? Yeah couple of those times when mom left him, you know, in the church. And that's why we tell you to go get your kids because we know <laughs> that it's possible not to go get them. And as we were growing up and as our kids were growing up, we were just trying to make a living, learn how to pastor and have a family, a blended family. And like you, we were just doing life and learning how to believe God, that there was never enough money can I get a witness in the house for that one? That there was always more need than there was resource. There seemed to be always more things to do than there was time to do them. And where do you juggle and how do you do this and how do you raise up a family? And so along the way, we did a lot of mistakes, but we made some things and we did some things that God taught us that I want to pass on to you. And number one, so there's six things tonight I want to talk about. And the first one is the power of unity, make a plan and work a plan. Get a plan. And get a plan in unity. If you're single, then you're gonna have to get that plan and introduce that plan to the people that are close to you, your parents, your grandparents, those people that are gonna help you raise these children if you're a single parent, your church. If you're married, then you're gonna have to do this in unity because you're gonna to have to become one with the children because it is at times us against them. I just wanna make that clear right now. It will be us against them. And that's okay because remember, they don't have perfect natures anymore, do they? The only one that ever, ever raised a perfect child was Mary and it was only one child and his name was Jesus. And after Jesus, all the others had sin natures, and I can only imagine what Mary and Joseph said to each other when the second one came. And let's just remember that as parents, Jesus' parents, they did lose God. Now, how many people 
have that call to fame. They lost him on the way to Jerusalem and on the way back, they couldn't find him. He was still in the temple and they had left him. So don't, don't be judging me about leaving Luke at church <laughs> because Mary and Joseph left Jesus at church and they lost him. The power of unity, make a plan and work a plan. Maintain a united front with the kids and with each other. What do I mean about that? I mean, Whatever it is that you decide on discipline, on priorities, on how you're going to raise these kids, you're going to have together and you're going to have to be in agreement because a house divided against itself cannot stand. And Satan will do everything he can to put a wedge in between you and your husband or you and your wife and those children. And if it's a blended family, it's even more sensitive because those aren't your natural children or her natural children. And there is a difference. And don't tell me there isn't because there is. Now the grace of God and the love of God can change that, but it's a learning process. So number one, the power of unity, get in unity, make a plan and work a plan. What do I mean by that? Well, let's start with ourselves. In the fall, when Adam and Eve fell, four things were broken. Four things. Number one, the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. Humanity and God, it was severed, it was broken, it died. It was separated. Number two, our relationship with ourselves, our identity was completely broken. Who are we now? Who do we identify with? Number three, our relationship with each other was broken. And number four, our relationship with creation was broken. So that's all being restored. But this relationship, these broken relationships have to be repaired and put back together. So the first thing in making a plan and working a plan is getting in unity. And that means with each other. And that means discipline. That means you too as husband and wife or you as wife or you as single dad, that you're going to have to be disciplined in your own life. We had to do some things that we no longer could do. We had to make decisions about things we were no longer going to do. We decided not to drink anymore. So there was no alcohol in the house. We didn't smoke, so there was no smoke or cigarettes. And I was, I was done smoking joints, so there wasn't any weed, and Jim had never done that, so we didn't do drugs. We didn't cuss anymore. And if we did, we immediately corrected it with each other and helped each other get sanctified and cleansed from the inside out. What am I saying? I'm saying that if you drink, your children are going to drink. If you smoke, your kids are going to smoke. If you cuss, your kids are going to cuss. If you lie, your kids are going to lie. Our behavior as couples and our behavior as parents, whatever it is we're doing, the kids are going to pick it up. You can hide it from them, but they're smarter than you think. And there are things that are just, just caught more than taught. And they're going to catch what it is you are doing. And if it's not right, and it's sin, it's going to pass on from one generation to the next. And so that is why we have to be in agreement as husband and wife. We have to help each other make a plan and work a plan. I would suggest you don't drink anymore. Now, you can drink and you can have alcohol in your house. Jesus turned water into wine. But for us, it worked better just not to have any alcohol in the house. It worked better as they were teenagers because they didn't ever have a drink. And they knew mom and dad didn't drink. So when they tried alcohol, there was a great conviction in their hearts that this isn't right. And they felt guilty and they were convicted and they didn't do it for very long. Are you with me? But when you got a bar full of alcohol, your kids are going to get your permission that it's okay. And when they're teenagers and when they're tempted to drink, they're going to see mom and dad's bar and they're going to go there first. So, how much are we willing to sacrifice for the next generation? You still like me? Make a plan and work a plan. So, some things to think about in this plan. Be disciplined in our own lives. If I drink, they will. If I smoke, they will. If I lie, they will. If I cuss, they will. Don't let your kids, another thought in this, don't let your kids put a wedge between the two of you. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? When it came to being blended parents, step parents, we had to let each other learn how to find our spot with that stepchild. When I married Jim, Miranda, my daughter, instantly called him father, called him dad because she didn't have a dad. And that was her choice, and he became dad. Kimberly, it took a while for Kimberly to call me anything. She was just awfully small. 
And she had a mom. I, she didn't need another mom. She just needed me to be the stepmom at this time in her life. Now, she's, I'm mom and she's daughter and I'll fight anybody that'll say anything else. She even looks like me, especially the blonde hair. <laughs> Find your spot. Be patient with those kids. Because remember, these blended kids are coming from two families. And they're going home to whatever it is they're going home to. And then they're coming to you. And it's hard on that spouse, whether it's the wife or whether it's the husband. It's hard on them. So if it's your natural child that's coming in and visiting and you've got other children, be patient and make a plan and work a plan with your wife or your husband, however it's arranged, because it's not going to be easy for either one of you and it's going to take time, but it will work itself out. And I'll teach you that in the love of God. I'll show you what God did in our family. Some other thoughts. Is that all right? I'm, I'm making a plan and working a plan. Being in unity. Be in agreement on discipline. You're going to have to discipline these kids. Now, I don't care what the state of California says. I care what God says. And God says, and let me give you some scripture here. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. Can I have it up? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now, the rod in the Hebrew is a supple branch. It's not a trunk of a tree. It's going to knock the kid out. It's not a walking stick, like a, a, a stiff rod that's going to beat him to death. It's a little twig. Have you ever seen a little supple twig? And when you cut it, you can snap it. You ever seen that? Well, when you snap it, it doesn't leave a mark, but it leaves a sting. And that sting is not abusive, but it's a memory of pain that says to that sin nature, if you do this, this is the consequence of disobedience, pain. Now, the state of California tells us that we are allowed to spank our children, but we're not allowed to spank them with anything, but I believe it is our hand. I believe our children's pastors will come in and they will, they will share that with us. So I'm not telling you to beat your kids right now because that would be stupid that CPS would come in and take them away. But let's see what God says about nature. He says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That old nature, that foolishness. And when you discipline them, that correction will chase it away. Let's look at another one. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. You know how you spoil a kid? You don't spoil a kid by loving him and being with him. You spoil a kid by giving him anything he wants, leaving him to himself, letting him have his own way, because that's only going to destroy and that's only going to cause that child not to live in the real world, God's world. And we want to give them God's world, don't we? Proverbs 13, 24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. You know what happens when you discipline promptly? It's dealt with. It's done. When you, I, we would get a little rod off of a tree, and we would just, a little snap. Now, when they were just two and three, we would just pat them on the butt and say no. But when they got to be about five and they were doing things, and some of them needed to spank and some of them didn't, it just depends on the personality. When we would do it promptly and when we would spank that child, that child would be in tears. We would gather them in our arms. We would love them. We would pray and they would know that mom and dad loved them, that this was wrong. This was a consequence of what they did wrong. And we could forgive, forget, and move forward. And that child was trained. But when you say, I'm going to get you, wait until your dad gets home. Or when you're just too lazy and tired to get up off the couch and do what you're supposed to do, and I know because I've been there, that's leaving that child to themselves. And God says, you can't do that. You have to pay attention to these children. Raising children is hard work. And women, if you're staying at home raising kids, you're not getting a paycheck, but you are doing some really hard work. Single moms or working moms, if you are working and then coming home and raising these kids, you're doing double duty, and I salute you because we know it's hard work, but there is grace from God to do whatever it is you need to do. So don't be discouraged because God can give you the strength and the ability to do this. Be in agreement on discipline. 
Don't compromise your God-given values to appease your children. I'm talking about making a plan and working a plan. These are things Jim and I had to do as we got into unity together to raise a blended family. I had to find my spot as stepmother. I didn't need to be Kimberly's new mom. I needed to be Kimberly's stepmother who loved her and was long-suffering with this little girl that came into a strange family. We had to learn how to discipline, not in abuse. But we learned that we had to get up and we had to deal with it right away, that we couldn't wait, that it was necessary for us to pay attention to the wrong and not leave our children to their own devices, but get up and take care of the business we had to take care of. We had to learn. These are things we had to learn. We had to learn that we couldn't compromise our God-given values. In other words, as a family, as a husband and a wife, or as a single parent, wherever it is you are, you have values and priorities. You better write them down and figure them out because we had to make some decisions in a world that is filled with distraction. We had to decide that there is no negotiation with church. We, before we were pastors, we were in every church service because we were hungry for the word. And our children were there. And when we started a new church and we weren't the pastors, we were just the attenders. And there was no nursery. And my children were in a bathroom because the church was growing so fast. I took over the nursery and I became the nursery attendant because I didn't want my kids in toilets. But I cared enough about the house of God and getting to church that I went and I took care of those those kids until then we became a nurse. I remember having 60 kids on Easter Sunday, me and somebody else. We watched 60 children all by ourselves because the house of God was important to me. Now look, if the house of God isn't important to you, if church isn't important to you, then you can just get up and leave right now. I'll tell you why, because you can't do this half-hearted. It's either everything or nothing. We're in a war and it's all or nothing. And this is how you fight this war. There's no negotiation about the house of God. We knew that in Psalm 92, it says, those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. We knew that it said that the very house of God was the gate of heaven. It was the entrance of heaven to earth. Now, we knew there were gates of hell that wanted to devour our family. But then there was the gate of heaven that wanted to bless us, wanted to help us, wanted to bring us into prosperity, wanted to give us all that God had for us, wanted to restore us. But I didn't know what that meant, so I had to get in the house of God. I had to learn the word of God. I had to understand some things about being in a church, that it wasn't going to be perfect. It was going to be hard work I was the one that was going to be the nursery one but guess what there's a fruit of it right here here's the fruit right here so young parents what are your priorities because you got to find out what there is not negotiation on you see soccer there's no negotiation on Sundays there's no negotiation on sports there's no negotiation on some things in our family growing up. Am I sorry about it? Did our kids complain? Was there peer pressure? You better believe it. But you see, I can either give them a good name, the name of Jesus, or I can give them a soccer career that they'll never use. You choose. I choose Jesus. Be in agreement. Don't compromise your God-given values to appease your children. Deuteronomy 19.14 says, you shall not remove your neighbor's landmark which the men of old have said in your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land that your Lord God has given you to possess. What in the heck does that mean, Debbie? What are you talking about, a landmark? Well, children are an inheritance of the Lord, are they not? A landmark, God give, a give Israel land. There were no fences. There were only landmarks to, to count where the borders of the land were. When you moved a landmark, you moved somebody's property line. And you stole their inheritance. That's why God put it in the law. Don't touch the landmarks. Now there are spiritual landmarks. There are moral landmarks. In my generation, we moved landmarks. One of them was abortion. It was a landmark. And my generation moved it and said, we have the right to choose these are our bodies, but somewhere, somehow, nobody thought about the other body that was growing on the inside of us. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know this is not a popular message with the world, but it's what the Word of God says. Children are reward and inheritance. So if I have an inheritance for God, and it's my children, then there are things I can't 
touch, and those have to be your priority. Church is one. The Word of God is the other. We had family hour. Before our children went to bed, we tucked them in. We prayed with them. We prayed over them, and we taught them the Word every night. That's where my children learned 2 Timothy 1.7. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When they were three years old, they began to learn that verse. So that when they were scared at night and they'd come into bed with us, I'd say, what does God say? And we'd repeat it because you see the word of God doesn't return void. And when they began to say, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love of a sound mind. What have I just done as a parent? I've just equipped them with the word of God. I've just put a tool, a sword in their little hand, their three-year-old hand and a three-year-old out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. It says in Psalm 2 that the word of God, the word of praise will be perfected, that God will destroy his enemies. A three-year-old can take out the enemy with the word of God if he's doing it in faith. Listen, we have no idea the power that God has given us as citizens of heaven on this planet. So get a plan. Make a plan and work a plan. Get an agreement. What am I saying? I know I'm saying a lot. I can do a whole message just on this, and I, I think I have. Nothing more. I won't say anything more tonight. There's six of these things. I haven't even started. Haven't even started with the weapons. Haven't even started with the shield or the sword or the helmet. Haven't even started with the real warfare that gets into your blood when they become older and now the enemy's trying to do more things to them. But it begins with a plan. Get in agreement. Define your priorities. Make a plan and work a plan. What is non-negotiable in your lives? In our lives, what was non-negotiable was bedtime, putting them to bed, praying over them, speaking the word over them, teaching them. What was non-negotiable in our lives as parents was family time. It was sacred, even when they were teenagers. We had to have time with them where there were no phones, there was no television, there was no electronics, there were no friends over. It was mom and dad and Luke and Jess and Kim when she was here and Miranda. And it was us and nobody else because we had to become a family. What am I saying? In this magnificent career of being parents, God has laid out wisdom for us. He says, first of all, understand if the two of you are walking together in agreement, nothing can stop you. So get together and decide. If you're a blended family, find your spot. It takes time. Be patient. You don't have to be the father or the mother. Find out what that child needs and be that for that season of time and let it grow. Be disciplined in our own lives as parents because what we live in the house is what our children will take on. Don't let our children put a wedge between us. We have to walk together. So don't let one set of kids come against the other set of kids and put a wedge between you and your spouse or you and your family. You must be in agreement and you must stay together. You must be in agreement on discipline and God says discipline your children. Don't let them become spoiled and have whatever they want. God says don't compromise your God-given values to appease the peer pressure of this society or your children. Find your options and stay with them. Don't move the landmarks. That's all for tonight. I hope you got something out of it. I mean, we took a family, God took a family that was broken and brought a blended family together and we became pastors. And during the course of pastoring and the course of our kids being teenagers, all hell broke loose. My goodness, we had girls pregnant. We had all kinds of things going on. I can't wait to share with you what God did and the miracles he did. So you see, it doesn't matter where your family's at. God's got a plan to bring them out of the darkness that Satan has a strategy for them. And next week, I'd like to cover all of that with the permission of our pastor, if that's all right. Because there's strategies. This is all weapons, warfare, swords, the weapons of our warfare. Bring somebody next week, somebody whose family's in trouble. Because our family was in trouble. 
And we live in a fishbowl as pastors, and we were honest and open with our church. You're probably not part of the church that was here then. There's only a few left. We almost quit the ministry over it. But God took us through. So I want to tell you, your hearts are heavy tonight. There's hope. There's not a family in this sanctuary right now that is beyond the reach of Jesus Christ and his miracle-working power if you won't quit and you won't give up. But what if you haven't even started? What if you're here tonight and you really haven't gotten serious about the things of God? There was a time in my life when I wasn't. There was a time in my life when I would just maybe visit a church because I knew that God was real and I knew Jesus was Lord, but he wasn't my Lord and I wasn't serving him. But yet there was something that just kept drawing me to, to churches. Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you're here and you're sitting in this sanctuary and you've tolerated a woman speaking and good for you. You've done well. God brought you here tonight for a very specific reason because you see, none of this can change in your life until you've done something and that is receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, nobody really wants to talk about what's going to happen to us when we die, but here you are in this sanctuary and you've been brought here, you've come, and you know, you're going to walk out those doors. And what if tonight was the last night on planet Earth for you? What if, through no fault of your own, boom, a car accident, something happens? I mean, life is fragile. That can happen. It's happened a million times. Where would you open your eyes? Would you open them in heaven? Or would you open them in hell? And if you're saying right now, well, I'm not sure I believe in hell, or I think, I think I'd open them in heaven. I'm a good person. I hope I'd open them in heaven. I do have to talk to you because, you see, you can't think your way into heaven. You can't hope your way into heaven. And you can't behave your way into heaven. There's only one way to heaven. Only one. Only one way to God's heaven. And that is God's way. And God says it's through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I know we live in a world that says that Hell is maybe here. Hell isn't, you know, it's not real. But God said it's real. God says hell is a very real place. He talked about it more than he talked about anything else. So whether we believe in hell or not, God says there's a hell and there is a hell. It's like not believing that there are microwaves or radio waves because you can't see them. Well, guess what? They're everywhere. We just can't see them because you can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And God says hell is a very real place. And he didn't make you for hell. And he didn't make me for hell. He made me for heaven. But I can only get there his way, not mine. You see, I can't be good enough. I can't behave my way into heaven. I know we live in a world that says many roads lead to heaven. And if you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven. But God never said good people are going to heaven. He never said that. Never. He said your goodness is like a filthy rag to me. Because in comparison to me, your goodness is dirty. My standard and who I am is not who you are. You can't behave your way into heaven. It's impossible. So God, how do I get to heaven? Well, there's only one way. It's his way. And he said, you must be born again. Born again. What does that mean, born again? Well, Jesus explained it. Nicodemus was a great rabbi in Jerusalem, and he came to Jesus at night, and he said, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And he says, well, what are you talking about? I'm an old man. I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you don't understand. What is born of the flesh is flesh. Your natural, physical body was born of flesh. But Nicodemus, you're more than flesh. You're spirit. And your spirit has to be born again. Nicodemus said, well, how is that going to happen? And Jesus began to tell him about the cross. And you find this in John, the third chapter. He said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. And as a representation of all of mankind, I'm going to lay my life down. I'm the only one that can qualify for this because I'm all God and I'm all man. I'm going to lay my life on that cross. And I'm going to take on the sin of this world. Your sin, my sin, everyone's sin was laid on the Lamb of God. And he said, if you'll look to that cross and you will believe. Believe what? Believe that I am the Son of God. Believe that... I have taken your sins, believe that I am your Savior, and let me come in and be your Lord, then you'll be born again. What does that mean? It means that you and I can't save ourselves, but God has provided a Savior for us. His name is Jesus. Have you looked at that cross? 
Have you believed that he is who he says he is? And now the second step is not just believing it, but now asking him to be Savior and Lord of your life. What does that mean? Lord means boss. He can't be Savior without being boss. It means, Lord, I believe you are who you said you are. And Lord, I need a Savior. I need you. I don't know how to do this. I don't even trust myself to be good. But God, if you'll take me and help me, I want to serve you the rest of my days. And I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. If you've never done that, then tonight God brought you here to do that. God's prepared your heart and you're ready for it. To get right with God tonight, to let him be Savior and Lord. All over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to him, I'm talking to you. Maybe you're a better person than I'll ever dream of being. I was the rebellious one way back in the dark ages. But oh, there was a day when I looked at that cross and I knew he was who he said he was. I didn't trust me because I always let God down trying to be good. And I couldn't. But when I finally said, I give up, please take my life. He came in and changed me forever. Maybe you're one of those. Or maybe, maybe you've just backslid. And you're not serving God and you know you need to get right with God tonight. All over this auditorium. And just, just a moment, I'm going to ask us to do this together. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've backslidden and you need to get right with God. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to bang this pulpit like this. My husband's big and he can make a big noise with his hands. So I'm going to go... Bang! Scared you, huh? I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand all over this auditorium. Why do we do it with heads up and eyes open? Because we figure it this way. If our Lord can lay naked on a cross and die for us, then we can say yes in a friendly church that's prayed for you to even be here and wants to see you get right with God. Because if you can't say yes to Him in here, how are you going to walk out those doors and live for Him in a hostile world? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So all over this auditorium, let's get right with God. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three. Let's do it together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Four hands have gone up. Anybody else? There's another hand. Just a few of us tonight, but there's already five people. Anybody else? Six? Anybody in the, in the rooms? Okay, I see that hand. All right, let's do this. I think there's been about seven that I counted, but I don't see so well, so maybe there's more. Let's sing. This is what we're going to do. If you raised your hands or if you didn't and you should have, I want you to grab everything that you brought to church with you. We're going to stand and we're going to sing this song. I want you to just slip out of the aisles or out of the family rooms and meet me right here at this altar. And we're going to pray and get right with God tonight. So will you quickly come? And if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late to come. You just come with everybody else. He loves us. He's the only one that can fix us and change us. Fix our families. Fix our kids. He's the only one that can deliver us, free us. He's the only one that knows us. He made us. He gets us. He loves us. He's not mad at us. He just says, come. Come home and come quickly. Just come home, kids. Come home to dad. Well, you are all beautiful. And smile at me because you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. It's yours. He loves you so much. And he assigned angels to you. And they've been working very hard to keep you all alive. And it says when one repents, one sinner repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. And have a little party. I just made up that dance. I don't think anybody's ever done it before. That's what happens when you get old. We can just have a party together. This is Pastor Joel. We're going to pray with you in um, the New Beginners Room because we want to pray and talk to you. And We're going to do three things. We're going to pray with you. We're going to give you time to know what you're doing. 
We're going to give you some stuff that our senior pastor wrote, easy to read. And then we're going to introduce you to a program. You're not joining a church or joining a program, but we are going to introduce you to a spiritual personal trainer if you want one, a friend. That if you don't have somebody to come to church with, they can meet you at church. If you need somebody to call and talk to, they can answer your questions for five weeks. They'll teach you five things. So this is Pastor Joel. If you'll just make a left turn and just follow him, we're going to come and pray with you. Your families can meet you there or out in the sanctuary. It won't take very long. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.